Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast, episode three. Today, we'll be talking about the Porsche Taycan beating its EPA range in two tests and how Inside EVs will stage its own range test. The Ford Mustang Mach-E deliveries are delayed. Polestar 2 pricing is released and much, much more. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Inside EVs podcast. This, for regular viewers and listeners, is episode three. And for the eagle-eyed and eared, it would normally be Dominic doing the intro. My name is Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast. Dominic, you join us in the same location, but you're on your phone. We've had technical problems this morning, but we, we've got you, but on a, on, I would say mobile phone. You'd say cell phone, right? Are you okay? I am okay. Hi there. Good. Uh, Dominic Yoni, the Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. So we still get you on the show and we'll work out the gremlins for next week, yeah? Yes. Great. Okay. And you, you can still lead us through the show as well. I just thought I'd do the first bit because we can't hear you too well. Uh, also joined us on the podcast, as always, Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hey, guys. And from out of spec motoring, and you've seen him on the Inside EVs YouTube channel most recently, is Kyle Connor. Hi, Kyle. Hey, hey. Okay, let's crack off. Dominic, you were saying the first story that you want to talk about is this uh, Taycan, Porsche Taycan uh, range test. Uh, just introduce us to the story, Dominic. Yeah, so uh, the Taycan has seen a couple of range tests this week. Uh, we had Alex uh, Roy taking it out for a spin and getting 295 miles of range. Uh, which is you know far longer, far farther than its uh, EPA rated range, and then we just had another story this morning on Inside EVs where somebody got over 300 miles, that's, and that's you know as again like much farther than it's supposed to be able to go, and so what's up with that, Tom? You've had this car before, and what kind of what kind of range things range re, um, result, results were you getting with it? Sure. So yeah, I've I've had the uh, lucky. Opportunity to drive Taycan Turbo and a type and a Taycan Turbo S. Haven't driven the uh, Taycan uh, 4S yet, which is the vehicle that these two latest range uh, tests were done on. Uh, and as you mentioned, one was done by Alex Roy. Came his estimated range came in a little bit under 300. And then the most recent one that we just posted about was Dan Edmonds uh, from longtime uh, contributor to Edmonds. Dot com actually now is with Autoblog. Uh, he did a range test and he came up with a little more than 300 miles of range. Now, one of the things I need to qualify with is neither of these journalists drove the car the full 300 miles. Uh, both of them stopped at about 210 or 215 miles and then added on the car's estimated range remaining to come up with their range. That's not uh -huh. the best way to do a real range test. Uh, if if uh, the Inside EVs readers probably saw last week, Kyle and I did uh, the Mini Cooper uh, SE range test where we drove the car till it wouldn't go any further. If you really want to do a proper range test, you try to control um, as many variables as you can and drive the car in a loop until it won't go any further. That wasn't the case with either of these uh, Taycan range tests. But to be fair, when I had the Taycan uh, a couple months ago and I drove it from Atlanta down to Daytona, Florida, uh, I also stopped at a Electrify America charge station and then added on the remaining estimated miles and said, you know, we have a 240 mile range on the Turbo S. Um, but that was, wasn't with was out of my control. I was with a Porsche on this drive and I couldn't, wasn't allowed to drive it till it stopped. Uh, but the good news is we're going to be getting a Taycan 4S soon. I don't have the exact date, but I have confirmation that Porsche is going to be giving me one. And you can bet when we get it, we're going to come up with a, a good course and we're going to drive it until it doesn't go any further. So um, these, while these two range tests are promising, that both drivers drove about 210 miles and still had like 30 or 40 percent of battery left. Uh, with what we're going to do is we're going to drive it till it doesn't go any further. We're going to try to do it under controlled circumstances. I'm probably going to do this with Kyle, and uh, we're going to see really how far the Taycan goes uh, on a on a proper range test. So, do you, do you think these results were a little optimistic, or do you think the actual range will 
will be in that 295, 300 miles. So, you know, until you do it, you, you don't know for sure. But I have a right. feeling that they're pretty close to what we're going to come up with because, you know, the, 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 when I drove the, the Taycan and I kept an eye on the, on the estimated remaining miles, uh, as long as I didn't, as long as I drove consistent, that the remaining miles were true. Now, if you drive 200 miles, uh, you know, at 50 miles an hour, and then the last, uh, you know, 20 or 30 miles, you've got to drive up a 6% grade and you're going to go faster. Of course, you're going to come up short of what the remaining miles are. But if the algorithm that the car calculates the remaining miles is correct, uh, if you drive consistent over the range test, it should be fairly spot on. So my guess is that when, when, when we do a proper range test with a 4S, I think we're going to get very close to 300 miles, but we don't know till we do it. So, you know, let's see. Yeah. A lot of it so, has to do with the buffer at the bottom of the battery and how the car is estimating the use of that buffer. So is that number predicting when the car hits zero uh, percent or is it one or two percent? For example, in the case of the mini SE, uh, our predicted range was very accurate uh, once we got about halfway through the drive because it's already seen how we were going to drive. But we were still even able to push it a few miles further uh, at the bottom just because the car is not designed really to be driven down there. They want you to plug it in before it breaks. And uh, But we were able to get a little bit better than what it had suggested. So my prediction, if we do a 90 kilometer per hour range test in the Taycan will easily get over 300 miles. Uh, if we do a 70 mile per hour, um, which are the two um, like highway versus city range tests that, that I like to do, uh, I, I think we'll probably get in that 280, 290, but that's just the prediction. So we'll have to yeah. test it out when Tom brings it down. Yeah, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to seeing the results for that. By the way, we were chatting on our kind of our group chat as we do during the week before we make the podcast, and I was saying to you guys how frustrating it was. I read an article about I forget either Model S or Model Three, but it was one of the very famous magazines in this country had reviewed one of the Teslas. Uh, again, good journalists know what they're doing. Not new to EVs. And they know that they can hold their own. They know what they're talking about. And yet the range they got, I think it was the Model S, the range they got was a lot less than it, they, they should have got. And so as I was reading the article and I got to the end of it, they happened to make in passing reference. They were saying, but still the car coped very well with the freezing cold conditions and the, and the, the, the rainy weather we took it out in. And that's why I'm looking forward to an inside EVs test because... For instance, we would mention that. So we would say, look, actually, here are some variables. And it was either a hot day, a cold day. It was raining. It was dry. Uh, the tires were properly inflated. We started with hundred, exactly 100%. All those things, none of them are deal breakers, of course. But if you are going to put your name on it and say, we did a range test and this you is what it do does, it. that's why I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys do. Because I know that even if you absolutely have to do something in less optimal conditions you would explain it to the the reader and you would say actually you know this means this because for a lot of people reading a general car magazine they wouldn't know that actually cold weather and w rain particularly really bad driving rain yeah. can hit range pretty bad so you need to always bear that in mind when you're reading these re reviews and it's not to say that actually what these guys who we've mentioned so far did anything bad it's just it, unless you're going to be followed around by a recovery truck, if you do, if you're working on your own and you are just driving around the streets, you don't want to drive a car around till it, it gets to zero and you pull over and then have to call recovery. So uh, they're good, but I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys do. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because um, we're going to start testing every single EV we can get our hands on. Um, here at the facility in North Carolina. And I really want to have a consistent uh, set of parameters that we test. Of course, we can do the standard acceleration, braking, cornering. Everyone does that. Every magazine does. That's no problem. Uh, I don't even know if it's that important. What I think is important is for inside EVs to have like the truest range calculation for that vehicle in the given circumstance. So I'd like to pitch this question to our audience in the comments down below. 
what do you think is important from a range test? Do, um, you know, things that I can think of, we want minimal wind, we want optimal weather conditions. Uh, if it's a winter test, we should make note of that uh, and talk about if the car has a heat pump or heat scavenging or something. Um, you know, speed, I think we'll probably do a 90 kilometer per hour and then a 70 mile per hour test. Um, you know, these are the types of things I think we really need to sort out. And then as well as charging, I mean, I think it's important to understand the car's charging curve once we plug it in. So this will be another one. Um, but the Mini SE, for example, has a great charging curve, small battery, relatively small range, but you can drive on trips because it charges fast till 80%. So you're getting a nice deep charge on that battery. So these are the things we need to, to standardize and then rank cars based off of these parameters. Can I also ask as well, and uh, just to, to, to jump in quickly, uh, where do you guys stand on, because uh, Tom, in, in the mini mini video that you made this week uh, for the Inside EVs YouTube channel, uh, Tom, you mentioned that the BMW i3 has the same drive modes as the mini they call them different things but if you're doing a range test do you use the most eco mode that the car provides because i've seen some people say yeah but that's not realistic you've got to drive it like a real person and they want heating and cooling where do you stand on drive modes what, what would you pick so kyle and i did talk about this and that's tough it's a tough call um but what what we agreed on I, I believe and what, what we what we did is what I usually do is when I'm going to do a range test um, I'll put it in the range mode or green mode but not the most extreme like in the case of BMW they have four driving modes not all EVs do that so we put the mini e in the green mode which is kind of like the range mode but we didn't put it in the extreme green plus because then that cuts out your hvac system your heating so you know I, I, it, good, you can go without cutting off hvac yeah right okay. you need, need to keep the key creature comforts it, turned exactly on. So, so um well like when i when i drove the uh the tycon when i was doing the dedicated run on the range we put it in range mode because i think that if people are driving a long journey and they're trying to get the most range out of the car, uh, they'll put it in uh, some sort of a green or range mode, but not the extreme one that cuts out all those cre creature comforts. So it's a good question. Under ideal circumstances, we, we do it in every mode and then like <laughs> that figures out there, but you're talking about a, a whole lot of driving. And I think it's most reasonable to assume that if people in their everyday driving, when range really doesn't matter, they'll probably leave it in the default mode, whatever that is, like the normal setting. But when they're driving on very long trips, they'll probably put it in range mode, at least the smart drivers will, um, as long as it doesn't severely cut back all of their heating and, and cooling and things like that. So in, in your neighborhood, Kyle, where we did the uh, mini, mini uh, test, Will you do that same loop? And how long is loop? Or what, what are the conditions like there? Do you have a lot of hills? Yeah, well, so um, the thing that I like to do is at nighttime, so we're right on I-95, which is the main highway corridor between New York, Miami, actually basically from, from Canada to Key West. And right. um, we there's really little traffic here. Leaving the facility and heading south, there is some elevation, very minor, but like one degree slopes that go up and then back down. Uh, something I didn't notice until Tom and I were in the mini and we're like <laughs> actually looking at the road. We're like, there is some elevation here. But once we get past about 15, 20 miles into the drive, it's pretty much dead flat from there. And um, there's a DC fast charging station uh, about 15 miles south of here. So the plan usually is just to leave here full, drive past the station, down 95, loop back most of the way to that DC charger. So only 15 miles of that loop is uh, not being driven in both directions. And um, I think that's, you know, especially on a Taycan that does 300 miles, it's such a small amount of driving, it probably won't make a huge difference. Um, because if I went to go down to Rocky Mount to go full charge a car in Electrify America station, I mean, it could take an extra hour for it to just complete charging there. So I think we need to be somewhat reasonable with that. That's true. That's true. And um, what advantage do you see driving on the highway as opposed to just like driving it around the track besides the sheer boredom? 
Well, I, I think that the, no, that the track's a good idea. I um, haven't done any tests and I will do this soon. I'm curious because our track isn't a straight oval, right? It's lefts right. and rights and not, not really much elevation. It's only five feet of elevation uh, throughout the whole track. Um, and it's two miles long. But I wonder if slowing down for the corner, speeding back up for the straightaway, I think that's going to be a unrealistic testing place. Uh, to get true, true full range of a vehicle. And uh, that's why I like having this deserted highway right over here. Uh, <laughs> at nighttime, I mean, there's very little traffic and you can just kind of go slow and you don't really get in many people's way. Or you could just go around your track at 40 and get like 600 miles out of the Tycon. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, 40 miles an hour, That's it, you could just set the cruise. It would make all the corners, um, <laughs> but the, the, the increase in friction around there, I, I don't know how yeah. that impact. I'll have to test it out. Yeah, there's some sharp corners there. I, I don't know if that would be the best. It might be a good city cycle range test, you know, if 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 we wanted to go that deep in the woods, you know, and, and do a, a highway test, uh, you know, at uh, those different speeds and then use the track for like a city cycle. Um, but again, you know, we could do 10 different tests with every car if we really wanted to be you know, crazy, crazily thorough and anal about it. But I don't know if that's really necessary. Yeah, it just comes down to are people interested or not, right? If we do a range yeah. test on a couple of cars and no one cares, well, we won't do it. We'll just provide the content that people want to see. Uh, if everyone's like, we need to figure out the range in every scenario, well, we'll do it. Um, but, you know, it, there needs to be a, a supply and demand thing going on here. Well, there's been a lot of controversy in the comments of different articles this week about the Tesla's range and how it compares to the Taycan because the Taycan is, you know, obviously the, the EPA range is pessimistic and people are, are making this, the claim that the uh, Tesla EPA range is overly optimistic. And I guess we'll get a chance to test that out when we get to Taycan and we can maybe do it side by side down the highway with the Model S, I'm hoping. And... Um, so you you both two of you guys drive a Model Three and some some of uh, you've had some time with the Model S as well. How how do you see its uh, real world range as compared to its EPA range? Well, I think Tom and I can both agree it's very difficult to hit EPA rated range unless you're in great conditions. Now I've certainly exceeded it um, in certain city driving scenarios, but I owned Model S for example. Um, and even on the 21 inch arachnid wheels that I had on my model S, it was a performance 100 kilowatt hour car. Um, that car would actually get closer to EPA range than my model three performance gets my model three rear wheel drive would consistently match it, but my, the dual motor cars and the performance cars, same drivetrain seem to be like a real miscalculation here as to whatever they were thinking. 300 miles is like anything close is not feasible. I think I've gotten 230 out of my car and that's a hundred to zero. So um, again, highway driving, but it something's off with, with this EPA calculation. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Yeah, I, I concur. Um, I love my model three. I have a long range all wheel drive model three. Absolutely love it. Wouldn't train it for anything else right now. Um, you know, uh, in that price range at least. But I agree with Kyle. Uh, it's actually the only electric vehicle that I've had, and I've owned a bunch and driven pretty much every modern electric vehicle at this point. It's really the only EV that I've driven that I can't easily match the EPA rated range, you know, without barely trying. In fact, I've never been able to achieve the 310 mile range on my car, even driving it to really try to have long range the best i've gotten is about 270 if i drive it normally as i just drive my cars i i get a, i get like 220 to 230 so still love the car i'm not bashing tesla but there's just something odd about the 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 epa range rating with with the, those cars that um you know i mean they do it and then the EPA can check it, verify it. So I'm not saying that there's anything nefarious going on here, but it's just something that just doesn't seem right. It's the it's the only car that I can't get the EPA range rating. Well, part of the problem is the EPA range test. It's really it's really designed for an internal combustion car, and they've they've just uh, rigged it, you know, for 
they just make some calculations to use it for uh, electric cars, but maybe they need their own test. Yeah, there's some inconsistencies, as you say, with the, with the Teslas and other brands don't have that problem, like we said, the Porsche getting it, and like the uh, the uh, Kia Nero EV does better than in the uh, Hyundai Kona Electric gets usually much better results. Yeah. It'd be interesting so, to see exactly their test procedures. I believe they published them somewhere. Uh, maybe Tom uh, knows the source of how we can get them, but I'd like to yeah, know we have those exactly what they're doing. Yeah, they're on they're on the EPA site. I can have it in my folder here. Yeah, fueleconomy.gov. They have uh, some some information there about it. But uh, yeah, it will be it'll be interesting to see what happens once we get the uh, the Tycon and yeah. So there'll be we... WLTP, EPA, NEDC, and then IEV. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, hopefully, the, the idea is just. To get a result that's really representative of what actual drivers see in the real world, um, given yeah, I mean, a, a mix of representative of a certain condition that the car is in, in one specific, like we know we'll get this on the highway and we'll know we'll get this in the city. Uh, I think it's important to have a city and highway range difference uh, because the cars perform so differently. And the way I look True. at it is, I'm either doing my drive exclusively in the city. Or exclusively on the highway. That's me, but I very rarely have this mixed driving scenario. Yeah, and and there is no one range. Like Kyle and, and Dominic mentioned, there's no. We can't do a range test, and then people say, "Oh, okay, inside of these did the test. The car can go 274 miles because it's the everybody's driving situation is different. All the conditions are different. But what we want to try to do is have a consistent test. So if we can manage the variables as, as best as we can, we can then compare car to car. Now, you might not get the, the range that we get in the test, but you can see, oh, okay, the, the Taycan got you know 20 miles less than the Model S. Uh, a Nero got 15 miles less. So if we can control these conditions, you can really look at the cars and compare it car to car. I think that's really what we need to try to do so that we can, you know, really give a, a, a consistent report and you can compare EV to EV because when you hop in that car and you drive your driving cycle, you're not going to, you know, by luck, you'll get what we got. It, it, everybody's driving conditions are different. So I think we just need to do the best we can to have a consistent course. And so that way you can compare EV to EV. Right. All right. So next up, let's talk for a minute about the uh, Ford Mustang Mach-E. Apparently, production and deliveries are delayed. That's uh, probably not a surprise to anybody. Uh, I guess when we get the news, some of uh, the Mach-E forums, some Norwegian customers uh, got some letters to expect them, telling them to expect deliveries in about November with production moving to June or July instead of May. Big disappointment. Uh, as long as they can get them delivered by end of 2020, I'll be sort of happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have one on order, right? Uh, we have a, my dad does, but I'm sure he'll really? let me drive it. It's a GT, but that's not coming for a little while. Ah, uh, okay. That'll be nice. What do you, uh, Martin, what do you think of the Mustang? Yeah, this is a really promising car and something which, again, I don't think gets the same level of respect that maybe it deserves, or maybe it doesn't deserve. I think I'd put the Taycan in the same bracket as that because of its EPA range, and so it kind of gets dismissed, and I'm not making this a tribalism thing against the people who love Teslas and, and all others, but I think at the moment the Mach E, of course, it had its fanfare launch, and it made it made as as big a splash over here as I imagine it it, it did there. Very excited to to have that car here. And look, I'm a bit of a Ford fanboy, so I grew up in the '90s with fast Fords on my bedroom wall on posters. That's uh, you know, fast Fords have a very soft spot in my in my heart and my uh, kind of buying car magazines as a teenager. So we really want to see. Ford do well with the Mustang Mach-E. I would say the thing that 
hasn't happened here yet is there hasn't been a level of excitement growing because there is that that big unknown of when it will arrive so it's not that uh, we're not bothered here in the uk and europe about it but it's it's it seems a long way off and and also the other thing as well is it's it's tough to get excited about a spec of car that is kind of unclear because uh, i don't know if this frustrates you guys as as well but i kind of come from i come from a, a kind of background of of you know i like things like the tesla lineup like the apple lineup of products there's that famous thing of when steve jobs came back to apple and it was just in the toilet and he divided the whole hundreds of products they were making. And he said, we're going to make four and divided them into four boxes and, uh, and turned the company around. And Tesla do that with their, their configurator. And I must say, it's one of the things that does confuse us a little bit because what you call the Mustang Mach E names, as it were, the, the, the spec names, uh, Ford have done that thing that all car companies do around the world they succumb to the regional marketing needs and the and, and the various marketing departments around the world who each argue for their own case and so i, I don't i don't know I, you say that your dad's got the gt on order and that's the thing that confuses me about the mustang i'd love for them to come out and say we've got three cars and three battery sizes but of course they've done that thing that all car manufacturers do which is to go we've got these and you can change the battery and then there's this and then there's the first one but the first one's all sold out so don't get excited about it but be excited and so that's our frustration it's a case of well we want to get excited about it but we don't really know what the car we you know what the car is yet they have had one in the uk on show in london invited people members of the public to come down and look at it and i must say got a very very good reception so we are excited about it and the other thing to to keep in mind here with mach e is well there's model y that's already out there that is in the same exact category as this car and now polestar 2 started production and xc40 recharge is not far behind um, along with kona and nero i would say the mach e is going to be definitely geared towards a, a better driving experience than Kona. At least I've spent a lot of time in that car. It's uh, technically very good on paper. It's a functional vehicle, but it is like driving a washing machine. I think the Mach E is going to be a little bit better um, and it just in more fun. Um, just like Model Y still can get a car enthusiast excited about it or someone who's a keen driver. But uh, yeah, I, I would say the, the excitement level that I feel here is quite low for this vehicle again big splash kind of low right now it deserves a lot more than it's getting but i think we just need to wait till they start hitting the streets and then that'll all ramp up tom what do you think about this yeah well circling back to the original question about the delay i i don't see how anybody can uh be you know concerned about that you know disappointed maybe but every look every new car that's scheduled to launch in 2020 is going to be delayed, uh, whether it's weeks or months. I just did an article on Byton. Byton was this was going to be their M Byte launch at the end of the year, and now the the launch is going to be. You know, they, they haven't really said, uh, they haven't really used the, the the delay word, but they're hinting that that's going to happen, and it's to be expected. But as far as the the excitement, uh, you know, Tesla just sucks all the oxygen out of the room with electric vehicles. It's, it's almost like, you know, uh, the only other vehicle company that, that, I, that I see that has really gotten excite, people excited was Rivian because they're making something that isn't out there, that Tesla wasn't selling, a pickup truck. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's hard for me to um, really gauge, you know, the, the, the public's uh, anticipation for the Mach-E because Tesla just owns this EV space right now, uh, at least here in the U.S. And um, uh, but I, th that said, I've talked to four dealers uh, in my area, and they're saying that people are coming down and putting deposits on these cars. So, you know, without without much, without any advertising, without much being talked about it, uh, the, the 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 original allotments are being sold out. So there's got to be, you know, there's got to be excitement that maybe we don't just feel like, you know, you feel with Tesla, just uh, my Tesla's parked on the street and everybody walks by and people stop and look at it. And kids are just like, dad, look at Tesla, you know, and uh, there's just so much enthusiasm for the brand 
Uh, I think it, you know that that's going to take a while for any of the other entrenched OEMs to have their electric vehicle programs elevated to that level where there's so much excitement and people want to see them. Maybe yeah. the it can't happen. On the road will do that because people will it, it hopefully it's going to be a great driving vehicle yeah what can't happen is a case of like what jaguar did with ipace which is hey here's our electric car now that's on sale we won't do anything with it or we won't tell you anything <laughs> about it and by the way we won't even send you more my friend works at jaguar land rover here uh our local dealer and they have two that they begged to get um but there's like low volume. There's none in the press fleets in the U S there's just one eye pace for the entire U S journalism community in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just think that's crazy. It's such a good car and they could be doing so much more with it, but they don't do anything. So I hope Ford mm -hmm. continues this push. I, they've put a huge effort up front. Uh, you know, a lot of marketing dollars were spent on this. They have good people behind the car. I got to spend some time with the chief engineer of Mach E about an hour really awesome experience um this car should be really good uh i just hope that they have the marketing behind it to sort of push through all of the tesla stuff i feel like just right about now is right about in this cycle where we would be getting seeing maki's going out for reviews too and, and some test drives and, and you know just to raise its profile so now all we have is pretty much silence and just some background controversy about them using the word mustang uh, for the Maki, uh, you know, which I, I think was a great move because that's it's really raised its uh, people's awareness and given it some mind share, you know, where yeah, you know Tesla really mind, dominates in that area. But you know, there's yeah. been some there's some talk about the Mustang, obviously, since you know we have dealers getting orders and you know people are pretty excited about it. Dom, I think the the like press drives were even. Before we had this, you know, the COVID nineteen um, shutdown and slowdown, I, I I don't think they were going to happen till around September ish anyway. Um, oh, so was, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I, I wasn't expecting them to be out that that early. I mean, don't forget at the launch event uh, uh, at the uh, LA Auto Show, we um, we weren't able to even drive the cars. We were able to drive in them but not drive right. them. And they were really early prototypes. I mean, these were, you know, the cars had plastic panels in them that, you know, we were told this isn't the finished product. So, you know, they were still, you know, six months minimum, six, seven months out from being able to give them to journalists to drive. So, you know, in best case scenario, I wasn't expecting us to, to, to do any kind of media drives till September ish. And now, you know, the, probably going to get pushed back a little bit. So, uh, you know, um, it, but like I said, this is all to be expected. You know, it's, uh, the car is coming and hopefully they'll continue to, to really push it. They did a fantastic launch event. It was, they spent a ton of money. It wasn't, they, they skimped on nothing. So, you know, if that's any indication that they're going to put the weight of the brand behind this vehicle, it, it, it seems like they're going to do that. So let's let's hope so. They did get some. Uh, they did have some booth space at CES as well. They had one model on the floor that people walk around and look inside, and they had one mounted on its side up on the wall, which was pretty cool to see. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So, uh, other news: the uh, Polestar Two pricing is out. This is a new brand from Volvo, uh, an electric sub brand, and the Polestar Two is their second car. The first one was like a plug-in hybrid supercar. Uh, a little expensive and out of reach for most people, but the Polestar 2 is a little bit more in our range and I, I think comparable to the uh, Tesla Model 3. And so the price is officially $59,900 $59, before incentives. You got some impressions about that, Martin? I think that uh, Volvo slash Polestar, we'll call them Polestar because they are their own thing. I just think they've got their styling so on the money at the moment. And maybe it's my personal taste. I just think the cars look fantastic. The specs are bang on the money as well. They are not going to blow anyone away. They're not going to, these specs aren't going to set a new level, a new definition of what a, an EV should be. But they're all on the money. Much like the ID3, I think, by the way, they haven't scrimped on anything. They're going to hit all of the targets that their buyers are going to want. But just look at it. I just think it looks stunning. 
And if you are not at the moment blown away by any of the EVs on the market, I genuinely think that the Polestar range, but the Polestar 2 is going to be a car that I think people should look at. And the, the specs, the internals, if you're not an engineering kind of person, they're all covered off. They're all going to be fine. The inside looks... I mean, it's 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 not the anti-Tesla, but it's certainly not the single screen uh, minimalism thing going on. You uh, you know, inside you feel like you're sitting inside a uh, almost like a jet cockpit. Really well designed inside and out as well. The nice little touches have been thought of too, and I really wish them the best for this. I just think it's a beautiful looking EV. Yeah, I agree. I I've got to see it in person. I am a huge fan of everything Volvo is doing for their design language for their cars. I think Polestar carries that same. I mean, if you took the Polestar badge off, everyone would think it's a Volvo anyway. Um, it looks amazing. It feels really great. The material qualities are nice and similar to to Volvo's sort of ethos. The Polestar thing, everything's just nice. You get in there. It's where it should be. It's not overly impressive. It's not designed to you know, set your hair on fire with performance numbers. It's just the nicest way to get from A to B. Um, and it's that sort of Swedish. It is minimalist, but not like the Model 3. It's it's really, as, as Martin said, bang on the money. It's perfect. I really actually wanted to get one of these. Um, however, the rear slopes a little bit too far down in the back for my big dogs, so they wouldn't really be able to fit. So I think the XC40 recharge, um, which is the same internal, same hardware, has a little bit larger trunk space, which will accommodate the the pups along for the ride a little bit better than this. But I'm a huge fan of this car. And that so the XC40 you, recharge, that's a, a, the full EV from, from there's a first full EV from Volvo, and you get that where you are as well? Yes, we'll be getting it. It's the exact same drivetrain as Polestar 2. So they're both built on the, what is the uh, CMA platform, uh, compact modular architecture? Uh, I actually think they're using the standard, probably an adapted version of the, I think it's SPA, Scalable Product Architecture, uh, okay. for the XC40. But, um, so the, does the, uh, just to remind me, I was at the uh, XC40 recharge uh, launch, but I don't remember, but I have the specs for the Polestar 2 in front of me. So do you, do you know offhand if the XC40 recharge has the 78 kilowatt hour battery? Yeah, it's somewhere around there, 74, 78 kilowatt hour, something like that. Okay. Same power I output. Yeah. The range is slightly off. I think it's probably just an aerodynamics thing. Yeah, that it's a, yeah, it is a yeah, bigger, yeah. can't be that heavier aero. car. Yeah. So while I was at the uh, XC40 recharge uh, launch, I got to ride in a number of Volvo products. Man, I, I have I had the last Volvo I was in was like an old wagon from the 80s, which you know is great. But it, th these things are world class, and I really like. And the sound, the sound system, the stereo, hours in the back seat. It was, I was so blown away. It, was it like, is worth oh, every penny. They're so good. My friend just got the V90 R design T5. It's not a plug-in or electric and oh it's so great uh and i'm supposed to get the new v60 plug-in hybrid polestar engineered very soon to test which i'll do some stuff with inside evs on it is one of the few applications where plug-in hybrids are used to enhance performance not just uh efficiency so that gets me excited so tom so the, the price for this is fifty nine thousand nine hundred dollars how does that come and that's before incentives so with incentives it's going to be cheaper Tesla has already gone through all its, uh, you know, government rebates, seventy five hundred dollar rebates. So, how do you think this compares to a Tesla Model Three now? Well, so yeah, it's while it starts at just a tick under sixty, um, I think most buyers are going to get um, a couple, check a couple of the boxes uh, that th there's some important options that that you're you're going to want. That it's probably going to still be around seventy thousand, so that it's still going to be a great leap higher than a Model 3. I mean, it, it, it will probably be this, uh, it'll cost more than a Model 3 performance uh, if it's comparably equipped. So I think in that regards, it's going to be a tough sell. Now, I like the, the Polestar 2. Don't get me wrong. I got, I got to sit in one on a couple occasions, um, and uh, it's beautiful. Uh, one of the things I didn't like uh, as much as, say, Martin did, Martin talked about the cockpit style interior, I think it's the layout is beautiful, but I also felt a little cramped in there. The center console is very high. 
Um, and one of the things I really like about EVs with, is with the flat, fo flat floors and no transmission tunnel, you don't have to have this, this big center console that kind of divides the two front seating areas. And it gives a feeling of, of openness in electric vehicles. Whereas with the Polestar 2, I felt like I felt like I was going back to a 1980s car where I was like sitting in a cockpit. And while right. it looked beautiful, the layout was nice, I couldn't help but feel like, is this the right direction to be going in? Uh, you know, it's kind of, it, it felt like a step backwards to me in that regard. Uh, I also think that uh, it's going to be a tough sell here in the U.S. I don't think it's going to do well here at all, personally. And I don't think that it's its own fault because I think it's a great EV. I just think that the fact that people, most people that are going to be buying uh, this or potential buyers will be their first electric vehicle. And they're already going to be concerned about electric vehicles. So I think they're going to try to go with a brand that they trust and who trusts Polestar. You know, nobody has even heard of Polestar. It's possible that they'll trust the Volvo name because it's a Volvo brand. I just think the whole combination of that means is going to lead to this being an absolute dud in the U.S. I don't think it's going to sell here at all. I think it's a shame because it's a it's a really nice EV, um, but I think the price the pricing uh, compared to Tesla Tesla right now for most people is the gold standard. You're going to have cars like the the the, the Mustang uh, Mach E coming out. They're going to be selling for twenty five thousand dollars less from a trusted brand. Uh, all that's going to conspire to um, you know you're going to talk you know. Dozens of 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 Polestar two sales per month, not thousands or or, or even hundreds. But let's say, man, I'm hoping for at least hundreds. But man, dozens. So that'd be heartbreaking. Let's see. All right. So, what else is news? We have a uh, let's jump back to Ford for a moment. They released yesterday uh, or revealed the Ford Mustang Cobra Jet 1400 drag race machine, which is built basically on the bones of their, they have a, a Cobra Jet series of cars that they, they make, I think this year they're making like 68 of them, I believe we said, in, on inside EVs. So it's a very low volume sort of specialty drag racing vehicle. Uh, and this, this electric version is a one-off. Um, Martin, have you read about this? Yeah. And you know what? It's great because there are certain people that won't believe that EVs are better until they see it with their own eyes. And you know what? That's fine. And we don't need to convert everybody. This isn't a cult. And there will be people that just need to see it and they need to see how great EVs are because they'll go to the drag strip. And uh, I know there's the whole kind of sub youtube community of of doing testers on drag strips and 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 brooks at drag times however these kind of projects are fantastic for getting headlines and they do change people's opinions and they're great as an example to show off technology you know they it does make the headlines we all got excited when we saw this yesterday whenever it was a couple of days ago and we see the video it just looks cool and it's great they probably put i don't know 10 people, maybe 10 engineers, and what do you reckon? A million dollars or something and said, you know, you go away and you do that. However, as cool as this is, should we be applauding car companies for doing stunts like this? Or should we get more excited when they put 100,000 people and 100, you know, or a billion dollars behind the development of a mainstream car that is actually useful? I mean, how good are these? vanity projects i'm looking at you vw idr going up pike's peak i mean how much use is that how much of that technology can transfer to the road cars does it just get headlines is there any point doing things like this i think it's cool to see and then i i kind of wonder you know could they spend that money on something else maybe right well this one's kind of interesting it's uh, 1400 horse 1400 horsepower hence the name and um, it, they're they're suggesting it will get low into the eights and the quarter mile, but it's the same team. If we look at look under the hood, and that's got actually you can see the components are from uh, Cascadia Motion, which is the same supplier and the, and the, the same components used by the same sort of 
the suppliers and the engineers who made the Camaro e Copo drag car from uh, a year or two ago. There, you can see it now. Yeah. So you got the motor in the, in the middle. Actually, that's two motors, two double stack motors. So there's actually four motors going on in, in that thing. And I, I suspect they're kind of uh, hooked together at the, on the back end, maybe with a chain. And those four or four things on the sides are uh, inverters. Uh, yeah. On, on the inside of these form, actually, we have uh, I have these labeled out exactly what they are. I, I uh, asked some questions on on a uh, Facebook group, and uh, actually, Mate Remac mentioned told me that the uh, about the inverters and, and what brand they are. And the engineer who behind the um, you know the whole setup chimed in and uh, named off some of the other things. It uses actually the, the same T400 transmission that's in the regular Cobra jet. So what do you think about this here, Kyle? Uh, well, first off, I, I don't think I want to uh, discourage anyone from doing cool things with electric cars. I think that's awesome, right? That's pretty cool. It's a cool halo piece. Um, personally, I just think this will never benefit an end user of this particular product. Um, look, it's really cool. They went fast. They got headlines. Typically, these projects are to excite the internal engineering team to get them, you know, pumped up about a project. Like, let's go make a, uh, you know, XC40 recharge or Polestar 2 rally car, right? That would get their team excited. They're not just building, you know, appliances, washing machines to drive. You know, you're doing something amazing. But this was all sourced from a third party company. So I wonder how many Ford engineers really got the pleasure to work on this project. And is this purely just a headline grabber? It will go get parked into a warehouse somewhere and never to be seen again. I hope that's not the case. I hope they do cool things with it. I hope they win races and do show the world. But until we see exactly their use case for this car, I can't be fully supportive, but it, it doesn't hurt anything. Like, great, go go do cool stuff. I'm all about it. Yeah, thoughts on this, Tom? Yeah, so you know, kind of a hybrid response to Martin and, and Kyle's um, for two reasons. I, th I, I, I'm supportive of, of this. Number one, it, it's just good to see uh, a different type of EV out there. One of the mm -hmm. things that we need to, to see is electric vehicles in all different sizes, shapes, and forms. So yeah, we, we need to see the manufacturers making these extreme, drag strip cars, just like we need to see them doing experimental cars that, you know, are super lightweight, extremely efficient with solar panels on the roof. You know, all that R&D does get baked back into the production vehicles. I've had a lot of discussions with, with uh, product engineers over the years and, you know, even kind of asked direct questions about why, why are you even making this car? It seems like it's just a a money sink and you're never going to come any out of it, anything out of it. And, you know, they all respond to me like, look, believe it or not, we, we learn a lot from these extreme cars we make, just like the manufacturers learn a lot from their formula E cars right now. They know, learn a lot about, you know, uh, power electronics, cooling, motor cooling, and that stuff does get brought over and makes their production vehicles better. Now this might be a little different as Kyle mentioned, a lot of the parts were third party sourced, you know, uh, you know, so I don't know, uh, but but I I, I definitely um, I'm happy to see it. I think that uh, I'd, I'd rather see them doing this than building some, you know, thousand horsepower gas Mustang that, you know, they're, they're not going to uh, really learn uh, as much as maybe they will with the electric powertrain, which they're still, you know, at the very beginning of understanding how to you know, increase efficiencies on the batteries and, and all the modules in the electric cars, you know, with their, with their gas engines, they've been, they've been, they've been tweaking them and, and perfecting them for a hundred years. So I think there's more to learn about the electric powertrain. So I'm, I'm fine with them doing this stuff. And, you know, it's great to see them put this thing on the quarter mile and run a, an eight second quarter mile. I think it'll open eyes of a lot of people that maybe weren't interested in electric cars before. So go for it. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't see a downside on it. Uh, you know, so I'm happy they're doing it. Yeah. I like that. If it generates excitement, I think it's great. I just would have liked to see, say, Mach -E, Mustang Mach-E uh, parts used in, in the Ford engineering team. Maybe the Ford engineering team can get some benefit 
you know, looking over this and see, you know, how these people who specialize, they've built a number of, you know, electric racing cars over, over the time and see how they do it. And maybe they can learn something through that way, which is, yeah. But anyway, moving on, uh, let's just hit Ruby real quickly. They uh, put out some a video last week and uh, an interesting little update of what's going on with them. So they're shut down their production. They're not, they can't do anything at the moment. And, and, but they're still working. They're still working remotely. Uh, one of the, they had, they had this little gift. They have one of their test trucks prototypes in a shop in North Carolina, uh, you know, on the machine, getting all its uh, suspension tested. But at the same time, it's being run by a guy being controlled by an engineer in like Irvine, California, like 3000 miles away. So that was kind of nice to see. That's in your neck of the woods too, Kyle. Yeah. Not far from here. I, you know, yeah, I guess you tried to shoot them an email. I don't know if they got back to you. We'd really like to get the Rivian here for some testing. Uh, <laughs> I think that'd be kind of fun to do something while it's at least in the area. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of everything Rivian's putting out between this story and their recent one about how they're designing their interiors um, and the use case of the vehicle. I, it's actually cool to see that they sent their employees and their designers to go skiing, hiking, skateboarding, whatever the task was, and then to make the vehicle better and talk to other people in parking lots of ski resorts. What don't you like about your car when you go skiing? Okay, we'll put this rubber strip on the back so it doesn't fall down. I think they're really taking a holistic approach to building a car, something totally different that we really haven't seen since Tesla. And uh, that's why people are excited about it. That's why I'm excited about it. And it's really important that they get their suspension tuning right and everything like this. So they got it on jigs. And that's uh, for the car to drive right. That's the last step to make this a winning vehicle. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we got to hit a couple other things real quick. But uh, yeah, it's exciting to see the Rivian project still going, and you know it'll it'll be here first part of next year, I believe. So uh, Hyundai, they last year they they showed us a uh, a concept called the forty five concept, and more recently they were supposed to show us something called the prophecy that that show got canceled because of the, the situation. But um, apparently, they both got the green light to go into, produ into production. It's kind of bizarre. Have you seen this, uh, Martin? Yeah, I kind of. Uh, it's very, very curious uh, to look at these uh, these concept cars. And and admittedly, this is take a look at that is is never going to make its way on the road. But I love to see things like this because they're an idea of where car companies are, are going. It's it's an idea of what's in their mind, their style, and. Uh, you know, going from, I mean, look at that. It just looks so kind of cool it's and interesting. And where's the, uh, where's the doors? There's the, okay, so there's the doors. Yeah. I mean, it's great. And I love stuff like this because it's, you know, it's, it's an idea of where they're going, but uh, will, will they ever, will we be driving one of these? Uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> what do you think? I, I believe they said this might replace the uh, Ionic. So it, it looks like a sports car here, but I'm not sure if that's exactly what they have intended for. And, and it won't have those suicide doors either. When it comes That'll to be it. a big upgrade from an Ionic right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. That teardrop shape and smooth, but it's so different stylistically than the other the, the other car, the 45, which is um, like a small, I would say like a compact crossover with the really high uh, door sills. Um, you know, it's kind of a smallish greenhouse and a lot of like origami almost and it creases and lines everywhere. Have you seen that, Tom? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, uh, I'm going to throw some cold water on it. Yeah, it looks great. It's exciting and everything, but enough with the concepts. You know, let's, I, I almost think, you know, the, the automotive industry should evolve from that. You know, for, for decades, the, the car companies came out with these wild concepts and, you know, 90% of them never made it to, uh, to production and I get that they learn some things from them and they can transfer that over but it's kind of like don't tease us if you're not gonna if this isn't gonna come you know and 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 if if you if you think that it might then say that but what I love is some of these new uh, startups like Tesla Rivian 
uh, th what they're doing is they're they're coming out with a car and saying, look, you'll be able to drive this car in two years. Um, and I, I think that's really what we need to start to move towards rather than these, you know, endless lists of concept cars. I mean, Audi was great for that for years with their EVs and they showed us so many different cars. BMW, to some extent now, it's like, you know, how, how long are we going to see concept I4 and, you know, uh, the, the I next and we just keep seeing these endless lists of, of, of concept cars. I remember the I3 was the mega city car. Yeah, it, it finally came, but like they paraded that thing around for four years <laughs> and, 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 and until, you know, in, in all different iterations of it, they showed it in a two door coupe and it's kind of like, all right, show us what you're going to deliver, please. And the other stuff, there should be like a big label on it, a big sticker that says, you know, not for sale. <laughs> And, uh, you know, maybe I'm a little jaded with it, but I've just seen so many EV concepts over the last five or six years. So few of them we ever actually get a chance to drive. So I have high hopes for Hyundai and Kia as far as the EV programs. But I'm not too excited about this because I don't think we're going to see it. Do you like these cars, Kyle? Not really. They've never done anything for me, to be honest. I just think it's a waste of time. <laughs> The concepts in general or the, these concepts? No, just concept cars in general. Like Tom said, I think sure. the i3 and the i8 uh, concepts were the only ones to ever really look like the concepts, and it came four years after. And, yeah, I look, I think it's a great way to show what your company's doing, you know, in the future, but you still need to sell cars today. So make those look good. Get those products on the road. I don't really care what you're going to do in five years unless I can drive it. This is just me. And uh, yeah, so not my thing. Right. I, I tend to like the concepts a, a bit, but I think maybe companies spend a lot more money on them than they really need to. Like, I, I keep thinking of the Aria, you know, they had a concept was the IMX or something like that. A lot of little straight edges. and But then they brought out the Aria, which was supposed to be, you know, derived from that concept. And uh, there's there's not a whole lot of resemblance going on. I love the Aria; it looks great, and that's another that's another electric crossover that's uh, high on the list of things to get excited about. But yeah, it didn't look anything like the original concept, and I believe the Aria will actually get some changes because uh, that's actually a concept as well. But it'll it'll be very it's very close to what the production vehicle will look like, and I'm kind of hoping to keep that same name as well. So uh, I think we should probably wrap things up. This, we've been uh, going for on, on for a little while now. And again, sorry about the technical difficulties. We'll have things straightened up next week. And so you can catch me on Inside EVs and the Inside EVs forum. And Martin Lee, you're on EV News Daily podcast every day on, every day on YouTube and all your premium podcast platforms. Uh, Kyle, you're on YouTube at, at Respect Motoring. Yeah, and you're on YouTube. channel One Lap, uh, youtubecom slash One Lap. It's One Lap of the Track in any vehicle. And you've already got a, a couple of videos up on that. Yeah, I did the Mini SE Tesla Model X. I have a whole bunch banked up from silly stuff to school buses. So yeah, you'll see some wild things. Yeah, definitely search One Lap on YouTube. That's going to be a great channel. I really love this concept. And Tom Longney, you can find him on Inside EVs and on the Inside EVs podcast. And that's great. Well, we'll see you. We'll see you guys next week. Take care. See you guys. And goodbye to all of you.